Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is our 2023 second base preview. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris as we roll through the infield portion of the proceedings. And, you know, second base is one of those positions that, depending on your perspective, looks like it falls off pretty harsh. But if you like kind of digging in the $5 player bargain bin in hopes of finding a $10, $12, maybe a $15 player, you might actually see some fun in the second base pool. And I think you seem to be more on that side. You seem to see uh, the opportunity in a position that doesn't really have stars. You don't see anyone going anywhere near the first round with second base eligibility right now. Uh, but you see plenty of guys who should play a lot, at least, available in the later rounds. Yeah, there's no $30 second baseman by projections. And uh, I think that's almost an opportunity because uh, once you get past the $20 second baseman, uh, Jose Altuve, uh, Marcus Simeon, um, Jazz and Ozzy maybe, um, you know, I'm saying maybe because as I sit here in front of the Bat-X projections on the auction calculator, uh, they are listed at $17. But round up to 20 for those guys. They are the stars of the position. Once you get past that, there's a gaggle of sort of $10 guys, $10 and $5 guys. In fact, that gaggle continues for 15 players. And so I think you really only start to get uh, in trouble with playing time around uh, Jean Segura, who is, uh, you know, a $5 second baseman, the 23rd by the auction calculator. Uh, but by average draft position, he is the 25th second baseman, you know, and he's still projected for $5. So, you know, if uh, I could wait 20 second baseman, uh, or if I could wait, let's say, uh, you know, 10, 10 second baseman between Jake Cronenworth at eight bucks and Segura at five. Why would I reach and make sure I get Jake Cronenworth? You know, um, when there's 10 guys in a row that have very much the same projection. And so I, I think that's opportunity. So I think, yes, if you want to stay clear of that me me mess, then maybe you get a second baseman uh, early. But if you don't get a second baseman early, get them late. Well, let's start with the top 50 overall second baseman. Four of them in that group. Jose Altuve, Marcus Simeon, both going inside the top 35 of most drafts. So if you're talking about a 15-team league, that's the early part of round three. Jazz Chisholm and Ozzy Albies also still inside that top 50. Usually more like late third round for Jazz, early fourth round, mid-fourth round for Ozzy coming off a year in which he missed a lot of time with injuries. With El Tuve, he's the highest projected player at the position. Good team, does a bit of everything, categorically speaking. I, I look at him, and I don't see the same concerns I ordinarily would see for a, a second baseman on the wrong side of 30. This is a position where I've historically been kind of afraid to take an older player, but we're just not really seeing concerning signs of a slowdown from Altuve. The strikeout rate's still good. He walked more than ever last season. He barrels the ball at, at rates that are at the higher end of his own career range. So am I missing anything with Altuve? Maybe I'm putting too much stock into the 18 for 19 as a base dealer at age 32 being repeatable. So if anything, you're lowering your stolen base expectations slightly. But this looks like a really good, well-rounded player who's aging better than most do at this position. Yeah, I, I've been, you know, a little bit worried about uh, trusting the projection for a 32-year-old player with Altuve. I've been worried about him getting slower. I've been worried about the knee injury that he wouldn't talk about. You know, these he's had these weird knee injuries. The Astros are pretty close to the vest with injury stuff, and I remember asking him point blank, "What's wrong with your knee?" and he wouldn't answer. So, you know, like. Uh, that worries me. And yet, uh, you know, you look at uh, his uh, times to first, what is a little bit strange is the 18 stolen bases did not come with a recovery. Let's say, uh, you know, he'd worked on his knee in the off season and, and did some rehab and, and, and improved his times to first. His times to first have been the same for the last three years, four, two, three to first. 
However, that's pretty damn good. And for his age, it's a top 10 speed in the, in the league. It's still top, you know, top third of the league that plays. That's going to be enough to steal bases again next year. And it does speak to his, you know, athleticism. It doesn't not seem like a guy who's just about to fall off the, the, the table. He had his best swing strike rate that he'd had in the last seven years uh, last season. His strikeout rate is really steady. You know, his walk rate was the best of his career last year. Um, like he just seems to, uh, yes, it, it's a little bit weird to see all this and uh, see his barrel numbers, see his power, see his size, and see the home run totals. That's a little bit weird. But if you've watched Jose Altuve, you know he tomahawks, you know, certain pitches and he pulls the ball in the air. And he knows how to get to those pitches and he hits homers on the pitches that he wants to homer on. You know what I mean? Like he, he knows how to get the most out of what he's doing a little bit like how Bregman uh, aims for the Crawford boxes. I think Altuve has a similar approach and uh, it's been working for so long and there's no real sign in the athleticism numbers that it's in decline. Um, you know, I think maybe even the projections for, you know, 24 homers are a little bit light. He said 31, 31, and 28 in his last three full seasons. Yeah. Uh, I have no reservations about Altuve where he goes. I liked it a lot last year when you could get him at a much steeper discount compared to where he's going right now. But this seems appropriate for what he brings to the table. And uh, I, I look at him versus Marcus Simeon. It's an ADP toss up. Remember. The end of May in 2022, Marcus <laughs> Simeon had a 199, 266, 274 line in just over 200 plate appearances. One homer, six steals. That was a 55 WRC plus. The first two months of his career as a member of the Rangers went about as poorly as they could possibly go. Look at the end of the season results. He ended up at a 248, 304, 429, which after that start is really impressive. 26 homers, 25 steals, got over 100 runs for the third time in his career, and still drove in 83. And we knew leaving Toronto that the counting stats were going to take a slight dip, even if he was the exact same hitter, lost a little bit as a hitter, didn't lose as much in the counting stats as he would have expected. So same kind of problem as El Tuve, where you're talking about a guy who's 32 years old now and could lose a little bit of speed at this point in his career has some batting average risk. That's what makes him, I think, a little bit different. But how do you look at Simeon? This guy has been ridiculously durable with so many seasons where he's at the maximum volume of playing time. I mean, over 700 plate appearances in each of the last four full seasons that have been played. He is also top 10 in sprint speed at his age. Uh, he's actually, I don't know, his sprint speed is higher than Altuve's. Altuve's time to first is is better. Um, but at the same time, both of them uh, have had really, really steady. Uh, Simeon has had a 4-3-6, 4-3-7 to first base for four straight years. So none of that went away. Uh, and then th the one thing that I can say for Marcus Simeon that always puts me in his corner is he is a tremendously hard worker that cares about his craft and wasn't, you know, wasn't going to put it away, you know, put, put that part of him away just because he signed a big contract. Um, so I know it's a step back. And so if you, if you look kind of through uh, the lens of kind of Glenn Colton and Rick Wolf's uh, you know, big, don't get the big contract guys, I, I guess that would be a win for their model or their idea that, you know, you don't, don't get these big contract guys at the same time. Uh, you know, for the Rangers, he was still a four win player for fantasy team uh, people, he was still a 26, 25 guy um, that returned uh, a pretty, pretty decent value. I'm, I'm getting it up right now, but what did, what do you think he had uh, for last year? For an earned value? Yeah. High twenties. High twenties for sure, because he was good in every category except average. And he was probably right around a normal low end average. 18th. Eight. 27 bucks, 18th in the league. Yeah. Ahead of Bo Bichette. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. Like, you, you're looking at someone who 
<laughs> only because he's been so durable to this point makes you wonder if he can continue at that max volume. But even if you start he baking in injuries, 724 plate appearances, it's crazy. Bake, bake in five or 10% lost time, and it's still a really good final result. This is the player that just keeps getting a little bit better as he spends more time in the league. And uh, I'm I'm okay with semi in here. If I'm choosing between the two, I usually like to get that batting average foundation in. I'll give up the extra bags that semi in will likely bring over El Tuve to choose El Tuve, but I don't think you're making a bad choice if you go the other way. It kind of depends on what else you want to do with those first couple picks and who else you like in the middle rounds. I like El Tuve ahead of Semyon, I think. Uh, I think he'll have a better batting average. Um, yeah, he'll have a better batting average. El Tuve will have a better batting average. Simeon might steal more bags, but uh, with this new rules with the bags, who knows, you know, might help Simeon get to get to the bag quicker C- considering his sprint speed is, is better, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, the, yeah, I, pr- but I approve of either where they go right now. Their average draft position is in the third round. They go right next to each other. So you kind of decide between the two in the moment. Both seem very fairly. It's early in the third round. So you kind of have to, if you have, you kind of have to have an early pick in the first round to get them. It Mm -hmm. looks like. Uh, But like, could you go like Trey Turner, um, Brandon Woodruff, Jose Altuve to begin a draft? Yeah. I'd be happy with that. You'd come away with, 50, 60 stolen bases, 50 stolen bases, 50 homers, 300 average, you know, 290, 280 average, and a horse. Yep. It's a great combination to have. Uh, if you're positioned more in the late part of the draft order, you're probably looking at a similar toss up between Jazz Chisholm and Ozzy Albies. Albies, as I mentioned up top, missed a lot of time with injuries last year. Depending on what happens with the lineup and Michael Harris's performance over the course of 2023, those two guys could sort of flip spots in the top third of the order, right? You could see Harris as a lefty getting those chances against righties, and you could see Albi as a switch hitter moving up against lefties just based on what he has done over the course of his career. But Jazz versus Albi's injury risk with both players. Jazz, we saw some really exciting things. The barrel rate jumped last year pretty significant injuries that he's coming back from. So how do you feel about these two guys after banged up 2022s? Jazz saw no drop in his sprint speed last year. He's uh, in the 95th percentile in the league in sprint speed. I don't know why I'm so uh, sprint speed uh, uh, hectic today. But the one thing is um, that I think that it's important uh, for is to give you a sense of their health and their athleticism and how they're aging. Um, and uh, Albies last year lost uh, a whole 0.1 on his time to first and went from 83rd percentile to 54th. Now, it was a, a, a litany of injuries, wasn't it? It was, wasn't there an early kind of hamstring and then a late, uh, and then there was a late uh, hit by pitch or something? Yeah, it was, or a, the, pinky, the, it was the, a pinky at the end. It had a fractured pinky, pinky but it was a broken left foot uh, that actually that, cost that. him the most time. Yeah. And that's to me, it's the kind of injury that, yeah, okay, you, you always worry about foot stuff getting a lot worse over time, depending on the nature of it. But if it's a fracture that healed properly, not really that worried about that. It wasn't a, a grade three hamstring strain where I'm worried about subsequent hamstring strains quite the same way. So relative to other injuries that cost you three months, I think I'm less worried about Albies than I would be about other types of injuries that, that knock you out. Strangely, though, the Aussie Albies drop in sprint speed came before the injury. Hmm. Right? Because he played from the beginning of the season until and he got hurt pretty quickly after he came back. And then he played two games and got hurt with the pinky. Uh, that's not that's actually a little concerning for me. That the drop in sprint speed was pre injury is concerning to me. I will admit that. Uh, however, uh, you know, he's going to get some boost from these new rules. Um, 
and he's always been kind of aggressive on the base pass. But you look at this, three stolen base attempts in 269 plate appearances. What if he only steals 10 bags next year? I was about, I was prepared. My bias is uh, to, uh, towards Albies over Jazz Chisholm. Uh, because Jazzism strikes out more um, and has seemingly been a little bit more injured. I think um, with this knowledge of pre-injury drop in sprint speed for Albies, um, I think I'm leaning more towards Jazz here. Yeah, Which is I unfortunate because I just took Albies in my, <laughs> in my draft. I, I like Albies a little bit more right now. I think if we see a clean bill of health for Jazz coming through spring, maybe they... Flip flop. What were the injuries for him? Jazz's injuries, man. He was so good at the beginning of the year. He was he was a fun player to have on your rosters when the season started because it was like, uh, hey, I'm right about this guy, and he's fun to watch, and that's the yeah. best combination possible. His injuries, though, he only played back sixty injury? games last year. Stress fracture in the lower back. It was a stress fracture in his back and a torn and meniscus. Knee surgery. Oh, so, so both, and that's where it's like. That combo is a little more scary to me as something that can hang on compared to Aussies. A knee and a back, both of those things. Well, then you got me flipping back. Oh, I am the king of waffles. Yes, you are. I am the king of waffles. Uh, Chisholm is so exciting. Do you think there's any chance that he plays shortstop this year? Yeah, with Miguel Rojas gone, yes. And what do you think that how do you think that would impact his playing time and work at the plate i don't he doesn't seem like a guy that would would carry you know if there were defensive struggles moving back to the position or anything he just doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would carry that with him to me mm-hmm. i know that's a really soft science 3000 mile away sort of observation but oh, well i broke it out with Simeon. like i think it's i think there's room for that i mean that's there's room for scouting they're talking about makeup and there is something about his uh bravado right that makes you feel like he'd be supremely confident even if he did you know have a couple errors that he could go out there and hit the game winning homer or whatever yeah i mean i think Anybody who plays in the league wants to be a star, but I think you can see it when you watch jazz. You're like, that dude <laughs> wants to be really good and he wants to have fun while he's doing it. Yeah. And that's pretty great. But I look at the the shortstop thing as just a it's a bonus, you know, right? You get the flexibility in season to play him at both spots. That's great. But I don't really see a downside to him going back there because he's played there before. It's not you know, it's not they're asking to learn a brand new position. He's just going back to the position he played for Pretty much all the time he was in the minors. So that's mostly injury that you have. Uh, you have uh, Albies ahead of Chisholm. Yeah, I just think the way people are treating Jazz right now, I'm probably missing out on him. If he falls to the next group, then I'm probably in. So let's look at this next group, right? If you bring him down to like the pick 70 to 80 range. Oh, I, I like him very drops. much ahead of these guys. Right. Tommy Edmond. Andres Jimenez, and then even Glaber Torres, who goes a few rounds after Edmund and Jimenez. I've moved Torres up to this group because I think Glaber is underpriced. I think Glaber, honestly, if you're going to tell me the price is even on all three guys, I might be tempted to take Glaber over the other two because of the park he plays in, good balance skill set. I don't think there's a tremendous downside on batting average. In fact, I think Torres might even be a little overlooked in that category. Really did a lot of things across the board well last year. Whereas I look at Jimenez, I'm not sure as far as how he handles fastballs. I'm not sure the the power we just saw from him is going to hold up. And then Tommy Edmond, Tommy Edmond, I think is a like a better, like more polished or a safer version of Jimenez. So I totally understand why he goes first. I prefer Edmond to Jimenez, but both of those guys feel like you're you're chasing your speed. That's what I feel like I'm doing every time I draft Edmund or Jimenez in their range. I feel like I'm desperate for steals and I'm looking past their flaws to get something they do really well. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see here. I think that I had a note about Edmund and how he did against his division. Um, And he's going to have fewer games against his division. So I'm trying to find that file. Um, let's see here. 
it's a di the schedule difference is is worth thinking about, but also he's still going to see those teams in division a decent amount. It's like yeah, so it's it's like what is it, sixteen versus nineteen? Yeah, it's a slight reduction. I think the question. Yeah, I, mean, I think the general thing for me about Edmund is is he a good hitter? Right. And if he's not a good hitter, he's projected for basically around league average. If he's not a good hitter, where is he going to play in the lineup? And if he's not, not going to play at top of the lineup, then you got to reduce all the runs in RBI, and then he becomes a guy who's going to hit, you know, two fifty with a three hundred OBP and ten homers and seventy runs and fifty RBI, and then the you're putting a lot of pressure on those stolen bases. And that's that's a great summary of why I feel strange about drafting him there. I think he's just a little bit light in other areas, skills wise. Even though production wise, it's been there. And if the skills aren't going to get better, the role changes. If the role changes, those counting stats that have been there the last couple of years are just a tad below where you need them to be. And it can still work. You do other things right, cover those holes. It's fine. But I'm probably out on Edmund unless he falls. 20, 25 picks off of that ADP because there are other guys that go in that range that I think are fantastic hitters. Even if they don't steal bases, I'm much more confident in them coming through, holding their spot in the order and being high impact players in several categories. Whereas Edmund, yeah, the power could dip, the average is just kind of okay. And then the counting stats could suffer if that scenario you outlined plays out. Yeah, I'm uh, also looking now at um, how good Andres Jimenez was against the fastball. For his career, he has a 157 ISO against fastballs, which is below his number for off speed and is is weird. Is a little bit weird. You don't. It's not really good production against. In fact, last year he hit 250 with a 410 slugging against uh, against uh, fastballs. That sounds okay, but it's it's not actually that good. He had a 360 average and a 628 slugging against uh, against changeups off speed. That's a that's a strange profile for me. That would suggest that he's just fending off fastballs and trying to feast on the slower stuff. Uh, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's where he's going to do more of his damage based on the way he's hitting now. I, he, is he young? Here's the here's the big question. It's not just about Jimenez too. For a younger player, and he's still he's still young, right? He's 24. So do you take what he's done so far against fastballs and say, more likely than not, this is who he is? Or do you do you leave room for some improvement at a certain age? I'm doing these pieces, and I'm going to do some more of them, about the 80th percentile versus the 20th percentile. And the next piece we're doing is the Cubs. And I'm working with Sahadev, and we wanted to kind of do something a little different than we did with the Reds. With the Reds, we did, uh, with Trent Rosecrans, we just did like looking at kind of the whole team and how good the team could be and so on. With this one, we're kind of going to look a little bit more at the players specifically and which players have the most volatility. And so I've been talking with Dan Zimborski, the father of Zips Projections, about what creates volatility in projections. I have a list of three things so far that I think matter. One is um, strikeout rate. So a, a, a hitter that strikes out a lot of guys, uh, no, a hitter that strikes out a lot is, is volatile. We found that from Bill Petty's research about the volatility. He's volatile from game to game, um, pro prone to streaks and that sort of thing. I think that, I think that makes sense from just watching the game. You're like, oh, yeah, these strikeout guys, sometimes they just go into funk. They're just striking out. They're not doing anything else, right? So there's a, the strikeout, uh, that function. So maybe they just have a good year where they improve on strikeouts or they're, they're streaky good, you know? So I think strikeouts are part of it. On the pitching side, not having strikeouts, um, you could get lucky in any given year with the defense behind you or or, or on balls in play, uh, despite allowing balls in play. And um, so I think not having strikeouts for pitchers makes them volatile. The other thing is um, lack of track record. So lack of major league track record. That's obvious, you know, because you're projecting off of minor league stats are not as, as robust as major league ones. And the third one is related to that, but is just being old or young, just being very old or very young because aging does have different effects on everybody else. And we can use an aging curve to approximate how good, how well people age generally. 
but that not always going to be relevant to Jose Altuve specifically or Andres Jimenez specifically. So Jimenez is kind of on the front of this and Altuve is on the back of this. We can look at how people age generally and say, oh, Andres Jimenez is young. He should improve, right? He's 24. Peak is 26. He should improve. But that doesn't, not every 24 year old that has a good season improves on their way to 26. No, sometimes that's your peak. Sometimes you peak yeah. early and then you just never yeah. really get better. And the league made some adjustments and maybe threw you more high fastballs and you were okay because they can't only throw you high fastballs. But maybe we've seen it already. But it's so easy to look at that and take that pessimistic view. But you could also just say, wait, no. Andres Jimenez gets a chance to get better. He gets a chance to get stronger. He gets a chance to see what teams do to him, and we have to know how he's going to adjust. I just, I think that's so hard. Every time we get anything new that we care about, the other thing we've talked about a little bit recently, you've mentioned the importance of exit velocity on the pulled fly balls, right? So Andres Jimenez might not hit fastballs hard all the time, but what if he, what if he pulls the ball and hits it hard when he pulls it, and then doesn't hit it as hard going the opposite way, that wouldn't be a problem, right? And you don't, you don't necessarily get that at a glance. And I think I'm trying not to fall into a trap with Andres Jimenez because of me thinking I've solved the puzzle based on the first few things that I look at. Yeah. Because he was a reasonably highly regarded prospect. He wasn't supposed to be a star, but he was supposed to be a clear big leaguer. Trying to find him on this page now. <sighs> Control F is not helping me. Andrew, Andrew Benatendi, Andrew Vaughn. I tried to put the uh, E with a mark in it. What's that called again? The accent. There he is. Yeah. Um, Andrew, Andres Jimenez. Has a 332, had a 332 Woba against fastballs last year. Uh, it's middle of the pack. Okay. Uh, so it's not a fastball problem. Yeah, it's not necessarily a problem. Middle of the pack. But, um, you know, 332 Woba, Woba is, you know, if you're going to be a slugger, is not great. Uh, his exit velo on the, those pitches was 85.4, and that is not good. Um, so by exit velo, and we found, uh, we heard from, uh, Robert Ord at, at baseball prospectus that, you know, predicting f- future exit velo, um, you know, is more important how, how you do against fastballs than anything else. So, you know, 85.4 on fastballs, 87.8 overall, neither one of those numbers is very good. Uh, and, and his barrel rate, 6%, uh, which is a, a little bit more predictive of a stat does not, uh, even predict, uh, much better than league average power. So, but you know, if he steals bases, 15 homers is fine. You do have a little bit of that question with the Tommy Edmund is like, is he a really good hitter? But I, you know, he's protected for better OBPs uh, than Tommy Edmund. And, um, and so he's probably a little bit better of a hitter than Tommy Edmund. Well, and I think he's safer to stay higher up in the order in Cleveland than Edmund would be yeah. in St. Louis. And, and I think St. Louis, yeah, team factors too. Yeah. So that's what kind of splits the difference there. They could be very similar players in the long run. That could easily happen. Being a few years younger, I think I'm going to give Jimenez the benefit of the doubt if I'm looking at those two guys next to each other. It is nice to have Edmund with the second shortstop eligibility. Played very well defensively at short, so it's going to stay there for the Cardinals too. Uh, but, but this is where I say no thank you. Hmm. So you're kind of passing on this group. The, these two players in particular, just not not reaching for them here allows me to do other things. Yep. And um, and I know they're projected for fifteen dollars, but it's a bit of a soft fifteen dollars for me. Whereas Gleyber Torres is projected for thirteen dollars, and I know he doesn't steal as many bases, but I think he's as good a hitter, maybe better than the other two, and. Um, and so I think that's like if I if you give me the three of them and I could wait, you know, 30 picks to get a wait a round or at least two, I mean, maybe two rounds to get Glaber Torres, I'll do that. And then once you get to Glaber Torres and I see, you know, oh, well, Cattell Marte is still a $10 player and Glaber Torres is a $13 player and Cattell Marte goes 100 picks later, you know, I start playing that game where I'm like, well, I might as well wait. 
you know? So this is where my slide begins. And it could be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe I should just take the $15 player and not play the, well, there's a $13 <laughs> player two round. Oh, I didn't get the $13, but well, there's a $10 player a couple, you know, a hundred picks later, I'll just take him. But it, it is how my drafts go was where I'm like, I compare what I'm looking at versus what, what I could get if I waited. And in second base, there are these enough, I, you know what they are? They're small steps down. Right. And uh, while I'm not while I'm choosing to go down this and I'm going to get a worse and worse second baseman as I go, I know these things are happening. I can watch it happening at the same time. I am getting better value other places. That's my theory. And you don't have, you know, in third base, we talked about the shape of the position. There's a shelf, you know, there's like there's like some really tight performers and there's a big drop, you know, and then late at third base, there's even bigger drop where you're just like, oh, I'm screwed. You know, so second base to me is just more of a gradual down where I can be like, you know, uh oh. Do you think part of that is actually from the way playing time is distributed at second base where some of those guys move around and play other positions so they don't get max volume playing time like a stud dirt baseman or a shortstop? They get a slightly smaller share. So that's why you have that softer curve in terms of the value. That's a really interesting question. Uh, and I think you might be right. Uh, when you look at, especially uh, starting with Glaber, to actually starting with uh, Jimenez, uh, the plate appearances, the projected plate appearances all start to coalesce around 600 and less. Mm -hmm. You've got 585 from Marte, 583 from Brennan Rogers, 589 from Jorge Polanco. 565 from Max Muncy, 595 from Jonathan India, which I guess that's injury related. I think that's the one team that might just plug him in and play him if he's healthy, you know? Uh, in, in fact, India, for me, just to speak out of your question, is is a guy that I like later that would make me pass on those guys earlier, you know? Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that is an interesting thing. It, it, it's an equalizer here. You, you probably aren't going to have a Marcus Simeon, um, you know, 724 plate appearance season from anybody other than Marcus Simeon. <laughs> right. You're not looking for that, but you're, you're just looking for the guy that doesn't share that job in part because other people can play it and they can mix and match sometimes at that position. Because if you look tier three, right, once you get past Glaber, you start to see a lot more multi eligible players. Tommy Edmonds, oh, the only imagine, one yeah. that we've talked about so far who has two positions already at second and short. Polanco was second and yeah. short. He's second only now. Brandon Lau plays some in the outfield a little, just a little. Vaughn Grissom's going to play short for Atlanta this year, so he's going to add shortstop. And then Tyro Estrada is second and short. India second base only. And you get down to Drury, first, second, and third. Jeff McNeil, second and outfield. Whit Merrifield, second and outfield. Jake Cronenworth, second and first. Right? These guys all start to move around in this third tier. And because they move around, I think their versatility in many cases opens the door for them not to be max volume players because there's someone else on the roster that complements them that takes away even a small share of their playing time. And that's fine. These guys still play more than strict big side platoon mashers. Those, those players tend to come even later, mostly in the corners and in the outfield. But I think that's part of why you see so many five, seven, ten dollar players at second base because you're getting 500 plate appearance projections throughout this like pick 100 to pick 200 range. Okay. So it's a good observation on how it's worked in the past. We now are entering the future and that's what we're all about here is like sort of projecting the future. How are the new shift rules going to impact second base playing time going forward? Because we know that from some of the work from Cameron Grove at, at uh, pitching underscore bot, we know that, it's going to put pressure on almost on second baseman the most of all the new shift rules. And so teams are going to want a better defensive second baseman. So in the past, I think you've had a Max Muncy type in at second, not getting uh, a, a, as many playing pay, plate appearances at second and having other eligibilities because he's not that great defensively. So maybe against a heavy left-handed lineup, he plays third or he plays first or he plays DH, right? And, uh, and, and I think you have that same sort of thing with just generally teams are 
finding second baseman. Shortstops are shortstops all the way through the minor leagues, and they're your star prospects, and they are going to be shortstop. They're very rarely, you know, Von Grissom, This is a, that's kind of a rare short-term thing, I think. It's, it's mostly they were shortstops forever, and then they moved off. So second basemen are found. How much is that going to change in the new environment where defense matters more for the second baseman? Are we going to groom second baseman more? Uh, are we going to care more about defense? Are they going to be more everyday players because we find someone who can play defense well at second and we just put them in there? Or are we going to have some more versatility because we're going to have more defensive replacements at second base? <laughs> and we're going to take Max Muncy. We're going to get a lead with Max Muncy. And we're going to take him out of the game or put him somewhere else because we need to put Chris Taylor or Gavin Lux at second or, or Miguel Rojas at second. So it could go either way. Yeah, and in the broader conversation we've had about changing the shift rules is that there's still going to be <laughs> there's still going to be teams that place guys better than others. They're going to trust that the data they're working with is going to work and they're going to play guys, they're going to leave gaps. They're going to do things that look a little strange and it's going to work because they've scouted and correctly they're and still they play correctly. Max Muncy at second. Right. So some teams are going to have that where they trust it and they're just going to go for it. Some teams are going to trust it, go for it, be wrong, and make a change. And some teams are going to be right. All of these outcomes are, are on the table. I think from a planning standpoint, I think you want to be a little more mindful of the quality of defense at second base. I think that's a generally safe approach. It doesn't mean avoid Max Muncy. It doesn't mean completely bury anybody who's bad at the position. But if you look in this range, Jorge Polanco was a minus nine in outs above average at second base. This is a guy that was playing shortstop before, obviously won't with Correa uh, being extended by the Twins or returning to the Twins. But Jonathan India was hurt a lot. Do we give him a pass on his minus nine? Colton Wong was a minus 10, and he had a great uh, you know, reputation. Does one year matter? Can, you, can one bad defensive year be something that you fix? I would argue probably, depending on your overall athleticism, your age, track record. It's complicated. Well, that's crazy. I just made it a two-year thing, uh, and Colton Wong is still a minus nine. Jorge Polanco is a bad defensive player, I think. And I th that's why I don't think he's going to factor in at short. And in fact, Jonathan India, minus 17 if you make it a two-year sample. Wow. How about Nolan Gorman at minus 12? <laughs> but Brandon Lau also seems maybe headed to the outfield for a few reasons. Right. Brandon Lau, minus three. And man, if he were, if he weren't coming up a major injury, he might have been traded by now. The Rays Minus, may have moved him this winter. Mm, yeah, that's true. And he's always he's always a candidate for that. But Brand, Brandon Lau, uh, minus six over two years. Um, also, I'm just thinking when I look at that team depth chart, there I kind of see uh, a situation where uh, they have more needs in the outfield. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's a center fielder, though, if he's a bad second baseman defensively. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so they still have Jose Siri in center. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I think Brandon Lau will play. But but will will Taylor Walls come in for him at the end of the games? If it's if it's five three at the end of the game. Probably. Taylor Walls is a great defender. Taylor Walls would be a shortstop in many, many teams lineups. And that's why I think I think that is related to uh, I think that's probably uh, that's already probably baked into why these these uh, plate appearance projections are low, you know, um, and so uh, I I have a thing that will continue. And also, I think, you know, moving forward cautiously and depending a little bit more on what's happened than trying to galaxy brain out the future is a better idea, because when we try to galaxy brain out the future, we might be right three years from now <laughs> yes like times these changes trends take, take a little bit of time to, to filter through the league i think many teams have an idea of what they think will work and they're going to try it for a little while and their best alternatives will determine how quickly they abandon that new idea <laughs> but like yeah but they specifically with these players do these teams have other options um Arias is not showing up. I might have to. Is he? I might have to uh, soften the something here. I think Arias is just a good can play all over and 
you don't necessarily give him an everyday job. I think Polanco is important enough to them for what he can do as a hitter where they're not going to mess around too much with his playing time. That's the sweet spot. I wonder if that holds true with Muncie too. Muncie is projected to be the fourth best hitter for the Dodgers this year by WRC plus. We talked about him on the third place one. And that's, that's part of Polanco, right? That's part of the Polanco thing too, right? I mean, where do you think uh, if you're looking at WRC plus projections for the twins, Polanco's third, 20% yeah, better than they, league average. You have to play that guy. And where, yeah. And where do you play him? If not second, because let's say you play. So arise, uh, I did find him in outs above average. When I softened the, the uh, requirements. He is a minus two. Uh, over the same time frame that Jorge Polanco is a minus 10. So let's say, you're, okay, our best team has a rise at second. What does Polanco do? You're going to DH Jorge Polanco? You're going to play Good Jorge sometimes. Polanco at first? It's not like he can just pick that up. <laughs> so what you do is you play Jorge Polanco, and if you get a lead, sometimes you put Luis Arias in for him at second. Maybe. I mean, if Arias is a minus two, is that even... How much better know. is that than a minus ten? <laughs> is that really you're doing that? You're doing that in the the ninth inning. I guess you you're might put that Kyle really late. In. That might not even cost Kyle you a plate appearance, in. though. Like that could be late enough yeah. where the, it actually doesn't even hurt you from a you know an offensive counting stats perspective. But I think also generally, um, sometimes I try to mimic what teams do. It, it does it does get you in trouble. Like for example, teams a lot of teams don't care about first base and just find first baseman. Right? If you do that in fantasy, you can get in trouble. I think because uh, first basemen create good fantasy stats, um, and they also um, you 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 don't want to do timeshare at first, you know, um, but. You can look at how teams treat second, which is find your second baseman. And to some extent, I've had uh, I've had good outcomes in the past with that approach. This ju- this range though looks like a good group of relative bargains. Like if you waited, I actually think there are there are more net positive players here than players who will return less than this draft slot. We should rapid fire through this group, just kind of an in out on these players. Max Muncy around pick 130. Are you in or out for this year? Out. Uh, I'm a little worried about impending Tommy John surgery, but I do know that the rules are good for him. Um, and I, do, I think that 130 ADP is soft. I think in some leagues he'll fall uh, much further than that. Yeah, I'm out at the price. Maybe in if he slides a little bit, depending on how desperate for some power I am. Polanco around 160, Jorge Polanco. I found that he falls. He fell in my draft uh, at least, and uh, I don't think he's appreciated around the league uh, because he doesn't necessarily do any one thing a lot. Uh, but I like that he does everything a little bit. Uh, I'm in. I'm, I'm in. He doesn't have to fall. I, I'd probably even be willing to go up a round or something to get him if I felt like he fit on my roster really well. Maybe a handful of bags, but power looks really steady. I think he gets back over 20 home runs pretty easily. Really good run production numbers to go with it. And for his sake, I think Carlos Correa returning is awesome because it's just a step towards them continuing to try and get better around that you just lineup. Want, like what you want for out of Minnesota is I've, I've heard, you know, Mad Dog being like, did Minnesota get any better? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, not necessarily in terms of additions, but they could have much better health outcomes next year. With yeah. Kirilov uh, and Buxton and Jorge Polanco. So. Um, if that happens, that uh, helps Jorge Blanco's run production numbers. In or out on Brandon Lau at 160? I, I might be out. Uh, the projections are surprisingly light. Uh, it's a $7 projection for him, and there's names you haven't mentioned that are uh, higher than him uh, by projections. Also, Lau uh, has some pretty extreme platoon splits. Uh, and a team that is uh, really willing to platoon. And I think they're going to platoon at his spot. So I think that's going to make him harder in weekly leagues. In daily leagues, uh, I like the power, and I think the batting average will be better next year. Yeah, I like him in leagues where you have a little more flexibility. Look at what he did, though, from 19 to 21. I mean, that's big-time power. Not as much of a batting average downside as you might think. I, I think mm-hmm. if you're if you're considering Max Muncy at all in this range, you should be thinking about Brandon Lau. I do think the the big side platoon risk has been there the entire time, but I'm okay taking that chance in the 160 range. How about Von Grissom, the new shortstop in Atlanta? Got to the big leagues faster than expected. Working on defense throughout this winter, we already have seen stories about that. 
was 20% better than league average over a 41 game debut last year. Showed some speed, showed some power, didn't strike out that much. Pretty interesting player in a great lineup and doesn't have a ton of pressure on him initially because he's going to hit the bottom third of the order. Yeah, he's he's really interesting because I think there's a lot of volatility around that draft pick a number. I think there's uh, people who are really, really excited about him and are, you know, sort of wish casting him into like, you know, 25, 25 right away. Um, then there are going to be others that are really uh, conservative with him because the projections right now happen with 475 plate appearances. So I'm kind of in between the two because 475 plate appearances is not right. I don't think I think he's their shortstop. And so I don't see a, you know, a real player on this team that I want playing at shortstop uh, that much uh, over Von Grissom. Uh, I don't think, I think Orlando Garcia is a, like really a, a backup. So I'm playing Von Grissom every day. And, and this is the type of team that does that, right? They take, they take their young players and if they're good enough, they just play them. So I'm seeing 600 plate appearances next year uh, with the projections, a 600 plate appearance season would give him mm, 15 homers and 15 stolen bases, uh, 15 and 12, something like that. Um, it's a good player and it's, it's better than his auction calculator number. Um, but uh, be careful about taking him too early. If you, if you really sort of believe um, in all the power and stuff, because the max EV wasn't great. The barrel rate wasn't great. Uh, the power production numbers in the minors weren't amazing. Uh, he's much more likely to settle in, I think, at 12 to 15 homers. Yeah, I don't think he has much room to move up and, and then still be in a range where I would draft him, but he's okay where he's going right now. And like we said, he's going to pick up that shortstop eligibility too, so you can move him around just a little bit in that lineup. A Tyro Estrada goes in this range. We liked him as a more of like a super deep league dart going into last season, and I think he exceeded any sort of upper end expectation we would have had part of the reason we liked him is because at the end of 2021 he'd shown some pretty interesting underlying skills 7.1 percent barrel rate that year a little bit of speed in the minors and yeah he didn't barrel the ball quite as much last year in an expanded role with the giants but, but there was power time, yeah. there was speed i don't know if enough has changed for him to really lose that role if he plays poorly enough then it can you know, playing time can start to go down, but I don't know if there's anyone there that's actually pushing him right away to start the season. Yeah, the the, the only caveat I have is in weekly leagues. I I, I just think this Giants philosophy is going to rob him of a lot of playing time. And you know, I think you know we might have seen basically his playing time max on the San Francisco Giants last year, 541 plate appearances. And so, where do you see that hurt him? 71 runs, 62 RBI. Um, and as good as he was uh, last year, uh, I guess, you know, it was a $15 value by the auction calculator, even with that. But the, you know what the auction calculator can't tell you is how much you're missing those plate appearances in weekly leagues. You know, how much, how much that volume is affecting you. You know what would be helpful? Maybe there's a way to make this. I wonder if I have the chops to pull it off. I'd like the to weekly see... weekly versus daily toggle on the auction calculator? Yeah, like the, the, weekly, the weekly playing time graphed out over, uh, over the season. Like how many times, how many starts per week for games mm. played for the team did a player have? Giants played six games this week. Tyro Strata started six. Awesome. It, it, I just want to see that kind of mapped along. And almost, like, and almost like a simulation of would you wither, like... You know how we play that game with pitchers? We're like, would you have started him or would you have? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like avoided uh, some blowups if you just didn't start him in these bad in these games, and how much better would he have been for you? Like I would almost like a simulation of of when I would have used Tyro Estrada and when I wouldn't have, and <laughs> where the value came. You know what I mean? Because uh, I just think that having him on your team in a weekly league is going to lead to a lot of questions where you're like. Oh man, they're facing a lot of righties this week. You know, are you know are the Giants going to pull any uh, any tricks with uh, you know a lineup of Crawford and uh, I guess they're kind of running out of infielders that are lefties, but uh, who could they who could steal his playing time as a lefty? Uh, Isan Diaz, maybe. Isan Diaz is a lefty, isn't he? But they don't. They really don't have a lot of options right now. At least I'm digging around. I'm not seeing much there. Uh, so I, I think Flores is a righty. David VR is a righty. I think his playing time is safe. I don't know if he can 
do everything he did over another Again. season. But okay, you, you're looking at Estrada versus Whit Merrifield, right? Because you're chasing speed if you're drafting Estrada, and you'd be chasing speed if you drafted Whit Merrifield. So who do you take between those two guys since they go in the same range? Different. That's be- funny because the Blue Jays don't have the same reputation for mixing and mixing and matching as much, right? And they, you don't think, oh, Blue Jays, they're like the Giants. However, Whit Merrifield has much more um, danger to his playing time, doesn't he? Uh, because Santiago Espinal is not an amazing player, but he's a better defensive player at second base, I think. Very good defender. Nine outs above average last season. Fourth best. Yeah. And they're both right-handers, so there's not going to be like a platoon situation there. So if they favor defense, and you know, there's definitely some signs that the Blue Jays are favoring defense in the outfield with the Dalton Varsho and Kevin Kiermeyer signings, uh, pushing Springer and the Teoscar Hernandez trade, then they might them they might play Espinal much more than you think over Whit Merrifield, and that doesn't bode well for Whit Merrifield playing in the outfield either because Dalton Varsha was a former center fielder. Yeah, uh, Whit's not a bad defender, so I do think that helps. But Espinal is good enough to push. Espinal is more of a threat to Whit Merrifield's playing time than anybody on the Giants' depth chart is to Tyro yes, Estrada's playing what, time. That's what I'm trying to say. You put the, you therefore, put the word right. Yeah. Therefore, if I'm taking a shot at one, it's Tyro Estrada. Hopefully, I've done enough with speed to not have to do it because I do see some skills risk in that profile. Uh, sounds like you're still in on Jonathan India after uh, an injury impacted 20. And he's coming after all these guys in ADP. Yeah, yeah a little after him. I like that. That is your guy, health permitting, that could just play every day. There's yeah. your guy that can jump ahead of this group and not end up in a 500 plate appearance situation just because someone else is nipping at his heels the whole year. This is a guy that has very little 2023 competition for playing time. Now, if he's hurt again this year, if the skills dip or something, Okay, like next year we're going to have some problems because th- that young group of outfielders is going to be even one more year, ready. One year on a on a on a twenty six year old, and and two and two years ago he had twenty one homers with twelve stolen bases. Uh, his max EVs are good; like he does actually have power. His barrel rate was better in twenty one, but you could regress back to that twenty one barrel rate and uh, and give him. That's sort of what the bad X has done with 18 homers and eight stolen bases. Now you factor in the the changes to the the, the speed rules, um, and I and I wonder that uh, if that won't help him some. You know, I'm checking. I'm not. I'm actually going to be. I'm a little bit uh, a little bit scared to, to to go on this tab. I'm doing Jonathan India's running tab right now. I didn't know what kind of tab you were opening, but okay. he went. <laughs> yeah, I went from appropriate. He, he went from 86 percentile to 59th percentile last year, but it was a hamstring injury. But hamstring injuries, if you were talking about which ones were you, aren't those the most worrisome? They're they're high, Soft higher up on that list. Around. Yeah, yeah, and it really affected his speed. So 59th percentile, but uh, you know the the where his cost is though, you're just hoping that he's healthy. You know, yeah. and I and if he is healthy, I see a lot to like. So, yeah, India is actually probably my favorite name at cost that you've said so far. India would be a, for me if if I was looking at Gleyber Torres, someone else swooped in and got him. India would be the guy that I'm looking to get a couple rounds later or a few rounds later that can do a lot of the same things categorically. That's what I'd be hoping for yeah. from Jonathan India. So I like where he's going right now too. I think we've talked about Brandon Drury on a couple other position previews. Landed He's more last spot. chance Looney for me. I don't. I, I, I'm not targeting him. I, I don't yeah. mind him, but I want him to drop and I want him to just fit my needs and not cost anything. Best thing about him right now, first, second, and third base eligible going into this season. Um, and then you got Jeff McNeil, last player in this group. We talked about Cronenworth on the first base preview. I like Cronenworth more than McNeil because I think the in-game power is more consistent. But I do think mm-hmm. McNeil is fine if you've done everything else. If you've gone with a few of those low average thumpers at other positions earlier on and you're trying to build back some some average, I I get it. I understand why you do it. A little versatility too because he's second base and outfield eligible. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about McNeil is uh, if there's he could be a real benefit. He's shown the ability, the, the real in 2021, the real drop in batting average was due to being shifted a lot more. So he's shown the ability to place the ball where he wants to in a way like he's kind of a guy who like puts the ball around the field now with more shift rules i think that gives him more places to go i don't know what i'm predicting but 
you know, I'm not saying that like he's going to hit 370 or anything, but like because he's already hit 307 for his career and 326 last year. But I think Jeff McNeil, uh, you know, he's projected for 273 from the bad X. Like, I think he can be a 300 hitter next year with the shift rules the way he is, the contact he makes, the just enough power he makes, uh, just enough speed. So I think he can be a 300 hitter next year. And that's going to provide a little bit more value than the auction calculator, which uh, does not love McNeil, but still says he's an $8 player. So um, I'm into uh, McNeil, Cronenworth, and India. as as And then one name we haven't said yet, Cattell Marte. Right, just going outside the top 200. This group is really not as bad as I expected. That's what my point is. That's my point. I like all four of these guys. You know, they, they each of them is going to fit a little bit better. And that's another thing I was trying to say about Tyra Estrada is like, he's fine. And if you need steals, he's probably a better bet than the, than the guys are coming after him. Yes. He's probably going to outsteal everybody. A healthy India could maybe push him, but if you need steals, Tyra Estrada is fine. But with Cattell Marte, Jonathan India, Jeff McNeil, and Jake Cronenworth at the bottom of the second base pile by ADP, and yet all projected from eight to ten dollars. Sign me up, man. That's I love that. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take those guys. I'm sad now that I took Ozzy Albies in my draft champions, but I am <laughs> gonna get my second second baseman from this group. Josh Rojas goes right around Cattell Marte. I, I are don't they both? Like it. Are they both everyday guys, or is it Cattell's an everyday guy and Rojas is one of these players that starts to leak a little bit of the playing time because they added Evan Longoria. They're probably going to use Ahmed in Perdomo at short, so you're not going to see a lot of Rojas there unless one of those guys gets moved off the roster. I don't know. Like They have a lot of outfielders, so there's some competition in the DH mix from that possibly spilling over. I've been really hesitant to draft Josh Rojas because things got so crowded. Yeah, I don't I don't like it. Uh, we'll only projected to be league average of the bat. Maybe they push uh, that production by doing a lefty-righty platoon uh, at third base with Rojas and Longoria. You know, there's not a lot of teams that platoon third base. And, um, you know, you have to think that maybe with Longoria's age and, and some of the injuries, Rojas will maybe get to the bulk. But how will he get there is important because he's likely for me to be someone who doesn't play that much early when everyone's healthy you know, gets to 450, 500 plate appearances by the end of the year by filling in for people, platooning, being a good utility guy, whatever it is, um, but could be have been dropped by then. So if Rojas is a, a pickup off the waiver wire in week, you know, five or six, that might make a lot of sense to me. Drafting him to go into the season doesn't make as much sense to me. Yeah, at pick 200, you're still giving up on a few guys that look like they have larger roles lined up. Uh, we'll get Bryson Stott on the shortstop preview, so we're going to s- step past him now. But Gavin Lux, second base, outfield eligible. Is that picture real? That looks like someone took Yandy Diaz's biceps and then attached them to Gavin Lux's arm. And then just I, were it, like, here you go. I this is Gavin Lux now. see Gavin Lux looking like that. Like, And, I, you know, what's weird is I don't think just bulking up is – is the the only thing that goes into bat speed like there's a lot of like sort of levers and and you know the the swing is uh, is a complicated thing i don't think you just ron gant it up and then all of a sudden hit for power so uh he does have the biceps to improve the power he is on a team that uh does care about those other things too about you know how to swing but he also has a long track record of really mealy uh, barrel rates and max EVs and and sort of not great bad ball power. But if he does come back, even if he strikes out 23, 24% of the time because he's, you know, trying to hit uh, for power, if he does come back with power, he does have everything else you need for a breakout. You know what I mean? Yeah. 25 yeah, get... year old yeah. contact, plate discipline, defense, base running. Like if he comes back with power, he could hit. 275 we've with a 24 percent strikeout rate he could hit 275 with 25 homers and 12 steals next year i know I'm he could still he in for sure you, I'm you're in 100 percent in he was 13 percent better than league average last year kind of in that super sub role without any power without the power he wasn't getting destroyed by fastballs i think that'd be my my red flag if i wanted to stay away from a player like this i, I he ran a little bit he was seven for nine as a base stealer so maybe it only comes out to be like a 12-12 player in an everyday role, but with really good counting stats and maybe a good batting average this late. That's basically what you're going to get from Gene Segura. 
365 Woba against bro. fastballs last year. 90, 90 mile an hour exit velocity. Yeah, I don't. I I think it could still happen for Gavin Lux. I very much believe that. And it's not. No, it's not the biceps pitch. Do you realize how infrequently you see a baseball player's biceps? They wear sleeves. <laughs> well, not in this picture. I Whew. know, but the, these guys could be walking around for years with with massive biceps that are just covered by sleeves, and we're just like, I don't know what his arms look like. And then one day uh, he's wearing a <laughs> sleeveless shirt on Instagram, and everyone's like, he's jacked. It's like, yeah, what, what kind yeah of noodle I guess arm player. Oh, you say he could have been jacked. He could, could have, have been, been that the whole time. That picture looked like an AI, like someone took an AI bot and said, "Make give me a picture of Gavin Lux jacked." I mean, Chat GPT seems amazing, but did it do that? <laughs> Can it do that? I don't think it. <laughs> I don't think it added thirty pounds, thirty thirty percent, thirty pounds mass. each. To, to his biceps. <laughs> that's what it looks like. It's crazy. Come on, it, it it is like Andy Diaz, though. That's that's kind of where, <laughs> that's where I'm at. Uh, we talked about Luis Rios a bit before. Really good, versatile player in this range. I think even with the increasing crowd in Milwaukee in that infield still a lot of playing time for Arias comes back to how important he is relative to offensive projection projected for that well lineup in that. Yeah. Projected. Like you said, like what fourth or fifth in the, uh, on the brewers high enough up. Whereas they mix and match guys, he's probably just above that line right now. So I'm in on Arias again this year. Segura has moved up a little bit now that he's a team being in Miami right around pick two forty. I think it's fine. It's the I same mean, thing you've always drafted there. It's just like, 10 homers. This is also, 10 steals. if you if you messed up and you didn't get an MI uh, and you're and you're late, like this is still a good place to be shopping for MIs. Uh, you know, I think Segura, Lux, Urias, and then a name you haven't said, which seems to be dropping. I think more than he needs to be. I know Chris Taylor isn't amazing. I know that he strikes out too much and he had a bad year. I know that he's 32 years old, but you know, when it comes to swinging at pitches inside the zone, he's aggressive in the right way. Uh, he's made it work with these high swing strike rates in the past and he steals bases. So, you know, by projections 230, 15, 10, that's, that's not that bad for uh, your, uh, for your MI. And uh, I think the Dodgers actually need him. You know, there's, there's, they, they need him in the outfield. I don't really like uh, Trace Thompson and Jace Outman, Jace Outman, Josh, Jace. Outman. <laughs> James, <laughs> James Outman, uh, I don't really like some of their outfield situation uh, the, as it is now. So I think Chris Taylor plays. You just moved his, you moved Outman's ADP up around by giving him a more fun first name. <laughs> Nothing against James as a first name. It's just much more traditional. So Jace, him a cooler Jace, first name, a more Jace, modern is worth, first name. <laughs> Jace is worth 10 points for ADP. <laughs> Yeah, he sounds like he'd be really good. <laughs> uh, Brendan Rogers goes in this range. We talked about him at the end of the season. If he's going to play a lot. He's not going to run. He's not going to steal any bases. So you need to make sure you get st steals covered if you're going to pick up an MI that doesn't run. Uh, Nick Gordon going to play all over for the Twins, second and outfield eligible. Nick Gordon would be a reason for me not to draft Tyrell Estrada 100 picks earlier. There's, a, yeah. there's, there's Every position has clusters of players like this where it's like, yeah, this guy did it last year. Nick Gordon looks like the guy that, because he can play all over, maybe he could be this year's Tyro Estrada. I'd rather cool. I'd rather fish at the end of the the draft for a player like that than use yeah. a, inside the top two hundred pick if I can if I can help it. I have a pretty good use case for Nick Gordon, which is, um, you know, auto new, you know, one dollar guy, um, deep deep leagues um, where you roster backups uh, but don't like play them. Because uh, he can be a one-man backup for a lot of different places. And if you get into a crunch, I don't know, it's interesting because um, they don't have weekly waivers and they don't have daily waivers. So if somebody gets hurt on your team, you want to have the backup on your team. And so Nick Gordon gives you, like, buys you time. Say, you know, all of a sudden you have a rash of injuries at MI or, you know, a lot of different positions. So Gordon's going to play like three different positions and four different positions. You can just play him at those positions while you're uh, auctioning off somebody you like better, you know, if you have to. O or if it's a, a short-term injury, you just don't st don't get behind in volume plate appearances and stuff like that. And you plug in Nick Gordon to just get some plate appearances while the other guy mends. So I, I like him in that use case. I don't love him uh, in sort of NFBC. I have to start him kind of formats. Now, I'm fine with John Birdie as a bench player because he's got second and third base eligibility. You're going to pick your spots with those steals. So if you're a little speed light, he's fine as your infielder off the bench. No problems with that. Uh, looking a little further down as we go, we got to wrap things up here. 
Michael Massey, I think, is interesting if he gets yeah. playing time in Kansas City. There's a lot of things he does well. Just has a handful of ways of making value. I know in a lot of 15-team leagues where you can make moves, he might be someone you're looking at more on the waiver wire in the early weeks of the season, but he could also end up creeping into that last pick conversation. Also just has upside to like put on your bench and see how he's playing. Cause if he's playing every day uh, and he, and I think he could or should be like, there's uh, the potential that he brings to the plate, the walk rates he had in the minor leagues. And if he brings that up and he gets his OBP into like the 320 territory, uh, he had some like good barrel rate indicators. The max EV was all right. Um, and he has some speed and the glove isn't bad. Like he could be a better player than Nicky Lopez. And, uh, you know, that's not that hard, a high of a bar to reach. Um, and so then all of a sudden you could have a player that uh, could go 15 and 15 this year uh, and play every day. And so putting him on your bench allows you uh, to watch the playing time and then drop him if you were wrong and do it without much uh without being too worried in al only i think pretty pretty decent uh one or two dollar player because i do think he'll even if he doesn't start every day i think he'll get up to 350 400 plate appearances on the year it's a great end game pick for those mono league formats any other thoughts on second base before we go uh no i don't like it as much uh when you get down into this territory um you know colton wong uh, kevin newman wilmer flores the only other name that uh we uh, now we brought him up in third base i'm just going to keep bringing him up isaac paredes Mm -hmm. is your sleeper at every position he's he's eligible um i think that the days of yandy diaz are numbered in in tampa and paredes uh with any sort of batted ball luck uh, will have a much better year. So uh, that's a name I like. And then Rodolfo Castro, again, uh, just from a scouting aspect, I like that body type. Uh, if he stops switch hitting, there could be a real explosion there for him. There you go. So we may have to talk about some late, late, late players on a separate episode because every time we do a position preview, we start looking at guys that are more like mono league sleepers and it's just hard to have time to talk. We could have a whole separate mono league sleepers episode. And then anybody who's not in the mono league and not listen because they don't care about the, the utility players on the Royals. <laughs> we got to get to getting on that though, because the, the timing would also help for draft and hold. If draft and hold season ends and then we're talking about these guys, that's not as helpful because you're right. The number of mono league players out there is, is dwindling. We still want to help you. We still want to do it. Yeah. Can. And draft and hold. We'll titles. throw that. We'll do, we'll do, let's do that. One of those uh, next Street week is yeah. next week is, well, it's pitcher week as we record next week's pitcher week while we record this, but then people are going to oh, hear this after right. pitcher week and they're going to be like, what's going on? Right. So that's why we told you. Hope you enjoyed pitcher week. <laughs> I hope pitcher week changed your life for the better this year. <laughs> we need to go on our way out. A reminder, you can get a subscription to The Athletic for $2 a month for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me on Twitter at Derek Van Riper. We're back with you again soon. Be sure to check out the rest of the series if you haven't done so already. Thanks for listening.